We're delighted to welcome you to the Poetics of Home Festival, a digital Chinese diaspora poetry festival this autumn, which aims to connect and showcase the diverse works by established and emerging Anglophone poets writing across the Chinese diaspora. We'd like to thank Wasafiri, the Institute of English Studies, Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre and the Arts Council England. Live caption function is available for accessibility. It's on the, um, the icon panel at the bottom of the control panel if you would like to use it. I'm delighted this afternoon, afternoon in the UK, uh, to introduce Cosima Bruno from um, SOAS. Cosima is a reader in Chinese literature and this event is brought to you in partnership with SOAS this afternoon. Um, Cosma is going to introduce the poets, uh, but I would also just like to thank Jennifer Wong, who has curated this program um, and has brought all the, all the poets together across this fortnight. Um, so enjoy the event. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to Founding Poetry, Language, Home, Self, organized by SOAS and Wesafiri thanks to the initiative of the poet Jennifer Wong. I'm delighted today to host three talented translingual poets of Chinese heritage, Mary Jean Chan, Nina Minya Poles, and Theophilus Quack. From different geographical locations and from different personal backgrounds, these poets have pushed the meaning of being Chinese outside of a Chinese culture. We will have a glimpse into their experience of languaging, home and place perception, relationships and belonging. They have all successfully entered the Chinese British world of letters with different priorities in terms of language, poetic form and readership addressed. I see their poetry um, as both breaking and highlighting the barriers of language and the distance between Chinese and English. Their works uh, uh, show racial and gender connotations and linguistic hierarchies, but also a sustainable effort to stretch and adapt in order to function across difference. I see their works as switching between languages, both as a privilege and a predicament, an intellectual and creative practice of resistance against the notions of English as a lingua franca and the English letter as essentially monocultural or monolingual, even if that there is not such a thing. So in fact, these works can temporarily resolve the watershed between national languages and literatures, presenting themselves as models of continuous practices of translation, creolization and circulation in the international place or space. As many of us have experienced, translation and migration constitute uh, rather vexed approaches to literature because they invite uh, the reader to map their words differently, uh, imagining a language and a space or a time defined by the absence of another. So all of the works selected for today are partially, if not completely autobiographical. All of them feature aspects of unfixed homing, translingualism, and all illustrate uh, the uh, um, translational processes uh, that accompany migration and understanding the world from the perspective of someone coming from elsewhere. Uh, translingualism has been a century long phenomenon exactly because it constitutes one common and obvious impetus of migration. Here, literary traditions are reinvented and borders and communities are imagined and performed through the social and ideological constructs of languages in movement. So Mary Jean, Nina and Theo will read from their recent works and will be happy to answer your questions afterwards. Uh, 
At that point, I would encourage the audience to post the questions directly to the speaker by using the raise hand function. For now, can I please ask everyone to switch their camera on if, you, if they wish, but to turn their microphone off. I'm going to introduce one poet at a time, then we'll listen to their readings, and then we pass to the next poet and the next one, and we will uh, um, leave, however, Q&A at the end of all the three readings. So we'll start this exploration with Mary Jean Chan, born in Hong Kong in 1990, a Chinese with English characteristics, as the, she uh, sardonically remarks in her first collection of poems. Educated in Hong Kong and the US, Chan settled down in London, where she published her debut poetry collection, Flesh, in 2019. The title of the collection, as well as uh, its three sections, are all French terms used in fencing to uh, indicate dwelling techniques. As a general framework of the collection, fencing sets a, a text world in which two lovers synchronically duel with one another, but I think also uh, is the intercultural translational battle where the body uh, is side of the border and boundary uh, between I and you, Chinese and English, mother tongue and language of empire. Flesh won the 2019 Costa Book Award for Poetry and was shortlisted in 2020 for the International Dylan Thomas Prize, the uh, Jalak Prize, and the uh, Shinus Hine uh, Center First Collection Poetry Prize. She co edits the journal Oxford Poetry and she teaches creative writing at Oxford Brooks. She will read today her latest poems, which have a hybrid form, I think, as prose poems or lyric mini essays. Uh, so Mary Jane, please to you. Thank you, Cosima, for that um, lovely introduction. I'm really delighted to be here with you all and to be reading alongside Nina and Theo, uh, whose work I adore, so this is a privilege. Um, I'll start with a poem from Flesh, as mentioned uh, in the introduction, that was my debut collection, and I'll be reading to you some newer work that's as yet unpublished, although some are forthcoming um, in various journals. So this first poem I'll read from Flesh is called, This Grammatical Offer of Uniqueness is Untrue. I have never said mother my entire life. She speaks Shanghainese and Mandarin, and Cantonese, knows select phrases in French or English, words like sophisticated, multisyllabic. She would pluck them like sudden notes from a warbler's throat. Her magic sleigh of hand at a dinner party where one of the guests is an elderly white man, professorial. When I say mother, I mean all those mothers I have witnessed or envisioned mothers of history and mothers of our present historical moment, all desperately trying to love their children, even those the laws have deemed as unworthy as washcloths, tumble dried for the last time, dirt ridden beyond help. So the next three poems I'll read to you are from a sequence called The White Series, and they were written in the early days of lockdown in the UK, where I was meditating on COVID racism, on whiteness and on language, and how these things are inextricably intertwined. White, one. During the early days of the pandemic, she asked herself if language meant anything when it was so clearly the body that faced in its existential threat. Keep going, she told her body. One day, she began losing blood. Her period lasted for 30 days. It was the month lockdown ended in the UK when people flew off on European holidays. Stress, her father once told her, can make you ill. It can make your hair turn white. 
She looked in the mirror that evening and saw many silvery strands sprouting like dandelions. The worst thing about the pandemic, she confessed to her partner as they lay in bed, is that other people, no matter how much I love them, are all potential hosts. Each night, she would dream about being in a large room full of people, then realize that everyone was unmasked. In the dream, bodies became repugnant. It was in 2003 when she first learned how droplets breathed gently into air could kill. They called it SARS. As a 13 year old, she learned this term alongside other words like sacrifice, sacred, scared. White two, after Sarah Ahmed. On my weekly train to Oxford, whiteness greets me as a bad habit, a kind of stopping device. I cease to drink from my orange juice as two white men sit opposite me. I try not to assume anything, to continue to inhabit a space of equals. One of them speaks. All those Chinese tourists who go to Bister village, he murmurs. You can go into a lift there and hear more than three languages these days. Makes you wonder whether you're in England at all. His companion laughs and nods. I stare at my iPhone, sip my juice for strength. Perhaps my face is a sign they cannot, have chosen not to read. From my bag, I produce a book of poems, placing it in the white space between us. The man glances at me. There is a look in his eyes I cannot help but recognize. He pauses, turns the conversation elsewhere. White, three. I learned that English meant good, that good meant the satisfaction of being praised, if only for one bright school day. For 12 years, I was taught that English was the lingua franca. Imagine being taught to revere a foreign language from the age of six, when children are most willing to please. Prior to 1997, French was an elective of equal standing to Cantonese. A rumor went around the school that prefects used to patrol the grounds, fining students if they ever spoke to one another in their mother tongue. English at all times, the teachers trilled. I never chose English. English was thrust upon me. My native fluency in English was a political outcome, wrought from the schemes of colonization, Christian missionary work, and language policing. Later, I fell in love with English of my own accord. Or did I? Love, when socially accepted, becomes habit. I took home the English prize for three years in a row, would let no one else come close. It became a badge of honor, a symbol of my uniqueness, though I was lonelier than I had ever been. At times, English feels like the best kind of, of evening light. On other days, English becomes something harder, like a white shield. It occurs to me now that sword and word are only one letter apart. So this next poem is a lyric poem and I was meditating on the presence of three languages in my life, um, Cantonese, Mandarin, and also French, and how uh, they intermingled with my learning of English at school, of course and how they always felt separate, that they couldn't belong in the same world. But at one point in my teenage years, um, they sort of came together uh, in Nice in France. And so I wrote a poem about that. A Reconciliation of Tongues. As a child, I considered often the impact that falling in love with English had on my mother's happiness. She once said, don't think you can talk back to me in a colonial language. It isn't superior. I can't describe her voice. When she speaks in Shanghainese, it is sweet like water. Her language came to me as in a familiar dream, a lotus flower sinking into myself and blooming. During my first month in England, I learned the art and science of speaking to reassure. How else can I survive? It is so easy to be ashamed. I am asked why my poems are so clear. 
I'll confess, it's what happens when you want to be understood. Ten years ago, I found myself in Nice and learned to dream in French, my mother's first foreign language. That summer, the sea was also my mother. The Bay of Angels held me in its polyphony, and I chose all my loves, Cantonese, English, Mandarin, French, spoke with a satisfaction I had not felt in years, saw my language, saw my relationship to the world through sounds again, till I was reconciled, the way rainbows exist in rain. And I'll end with a longer um, prose poem. And again, it sort of reflects on my mother's experience of language in Hong Kong, where she spoke Shanghainese and Mandarin, but had to acquire Cantonese, and how that sort of affected our relationship as uh, I grew up and queerness came into the picture. And then later on for my own language, uh, how I interacted with French and also Cantonese once again, as I go back every year. Thank you for listening. How it must be said. In the 1980s, a manicurist asked my mother where she was originally from. She replied, Shanghai. The woman said, so now the mainland Chinese have rice to eat. No more congee, I suppose. You're rich enough to afford a manicure. As a television scriptwriter, my mother wrote in standard Chinese, but the editor ordered her to acquire Cantonese. After another bitter fight with my mother over my refusal to wear a dress, I sat crying in my room. My father came in to talk to me. He said, you know that Cantonese isn't your mother's native dialect. I looked at him. What did language have to do with pain? He said, try to speak to her in Shanghainese. She's much gentler in her mother tongue. Do you want to be liked or seen? My therapist asks. Each year I migrate between cities and cells. How a familiar voice can make one weep. For my 31st birthday, a friend translates a poem of mine into French, her mother tongue. I am a stubborn beginner in her language, so I surrender to the sensation of being translated and therefore seen. Plants without roots wither in rain my mother tells me in a text message. This is a translation, the way I understand my mother in three languages. For over a decade, I have taken what I could bear from the source text and discarded the rest. What do you miss most about Hong Kong? A friend asks. Cantonese, I say, how it sounds like summer rain. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Jane. Wonderful uh, readings. Um, so uh, we will pass now to Nina Mia Pols, um, who was born in 1993. Uh, the poetry um, of Nina uh, uses Chinese and Maori as the languages of self inquiry and nature as the site of coexistence and multiplicity. Born in Wellington of mixed uh, Malay Chinese heritage, Pose uh, currently lives in London where she published, uh, published her uh, poetry collection Magnolia Mulan uh, in 2020, shortlisted uh, for the uh, forward prize for best first book of poetry. She's founding editor of the small press Bitter Melon, which focuses on Asian uh, diaspora poets. She was recipient of the uh, Women Poets Prize UK in 2018, the inaugural uh, Nan Shepherd Prize for Nature Writing, and the Landfall uh, Essay Competition in 2019. She's digital editor of Was a Fairy magazine. 
Paul's writing contemplates nature, as I said, uh, but also places, food, uh, memories. Uh, in our poem, uh, Maps, uh, Tito, uh, uh, boundaries and lines are reconstructed and uh, uh, rearranged by the skillful hand that makes origami flowers out of tube maps. Uh, Paul's languaging, her multilingualism and effort at naming combines with experimental practices. And I see Nina's languaging as proud trans translingualism in action, uh, having not just the goal of destabilizing the English tongue, but also of showing how varied the natural world is. Uh, describe uh, the limitation of knowledge and break down generalizations that confuse magnolias with uh, cherry blossoms. Um, so Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Cosima, for that intro. And i um, still feeling a bit dazed in a good way after listening to Mary Jean. Uh, it was so beautiful and I feel so pleased to be reading with Theo as well. Um, and thank you all of you and Jenny and Elizabeth and Jin Hao and everyone involved with Poetics of Home. It's an incredible achievement. I'll read poems that are from my collection Magnolia Mulan, which came out last year, last summer. And I'll start with the Girl Warrior. Girl Warrior or watching Mulan in Chinese with English subtitles. One. I remember the sound the sword made when she cut off all her hair. A sound like my mother cutting fabric, those blue scissors clutched in her small hands. I remember wondering why she didn't cut from the roots. A Disney princess kneeling in the smoke colored dark with straight hair, thin waist, hardly any breasts. Unlike me with my thick legs and too much hair that doesn't stay. Why don't we cut it short, she said, and so we did. But soon it curled sideways, ungracefully caught in the wind of some perpetual hurricane. Two. When I watch Mulan in Chinese with English subtitles, I understand only some of the words. My focus shifts to certain details. How Mulan drags a very large can cannon across the snow with very small wrists. How the villain has skin as dark as coal and such small eyes, he has no irises. Once a guy told me mixed girls are the most beautiful because they aren't really white, but they aren't really Asian either. Three. After Mulan saves China, fireworks rain down in waves of multicolored stars. You fight pretty good, says her boyfriend with the big American arms. I have small victories too being kind to my body for one day, not checking my phone for your texts, walking home at night alone and not feeling lonely. Four, why don't you ever write about yourself? I didn't know why either. In Chinese, one word can lead you out of the dark, then back into it in a single breath. Shut off the light as my mother, and other Chinese mothers say, now open it. Five, when Mulan returns home, the colors change from gray, blue, green to pink, warm, yellow. There are plum blossoms floating in a stream. Her hair is still a little messy to make sure we don't forget she used to be something else. Six, when summer ended, rain poured off the edge of elevated highways and washed away the moon. I no longer have a sword, but sometimes at night I hold my keys between my fingers. I paint my lips. I draw avalanches. 
I light fires inside dream palaces. I cut my hair over the bathroom sink. So I'm going to um, read another couple of Shanghai poems. Um, quite a lot of the poems in the book were written when I was living in Shanghai studying Chinese after I um, graduated from uni in Wellington in New Zealand and didn't know what I was going to do next. So I went to China, uh, which I'd always been promising my mom I would do to go and properly uh, study Mandarin. So um, yeah, and that went okay. And I also wrote a lot of poems. <laughs> so, um, and this poem is about um, a New Zealand poet actually called Robin Hyde, who uh, in the 1930s traveled to China and was a journalist um, and was writing like war correspondence for newspapers, mostly in Hong Kong, but she also went to Shanghai and Wuhan. And this is an imagined letter of hers. Letter from Shanghai, 1938. Thank you for the retelling of your dream. I too saw the city turning blue. I tried to write and link up some poems, but our childhood places are in fragments. Almost every night lying in the red padded quilt, I dream about New Zealand, the hills above the house on fire. And when I wake, I don't know where I am. Wild mint and burning gorse green light sinking through stained glass. Do you find that in traveling, peace isn't deep enough? Do you miss it too? The screaming pink azaleas make me too tender and too wild. This morning I saw bodies in the river and afterwards I could not write. Tell me of the view outside your window. Tell me the things you wish not to forget, and I'll tell you mine. The wild azaleas, my green bicycle, Shanghai girls in their blue cotton jackets. The 18 strokes of my new name, Wei Ai Ru, which I'm learning how to write slowly with my own hand. There are parts of the city still unburnt, I, I hope you may see it one day, its wet petaled glory, breathing and unhurt. Mid-Autumn Moon Festival 2016. The city is turning, the trees are turning. We are walking and then swimming, through a sea of yellow leaves when Louise stops to bite a perfect persimmon. Her front teeth pierce the skin and she is laughing. I remember my mum cutting persimmons in the sun one afternoon. Soft orange bits stuck to her palm. We look up the Chinese name for persimmon on my phone. Shizi. We taste the word, we cut it open wondering at how it sounds so like the word for lion, shi zi, lion fruit, like a tiny roaring sun, shiny lion fruit. At dusk, we sit outside cutting moon cakes into quarters with a plastic knife, peering at their insides. Candied peanut or purple yam, matcha or red bean, the moon looks like a single scoop of red bean ice cream. But really, it's a girl who ate her beloved, then swallowed the sun he gave her as a gift. Oh, there's always so much to be lovesick for when seasons change. Green bird cages and plastic moon goddesses and pink undies hanging up to dry above the street and boys who only text at night. We lick the sugar off our wrists and it's been so long, so long. Um, this next one, uh, another Shanghai one. Um, I used to go 
to the cinema a lot by myself when I lived in Shanghai. It was very cheap and uh, it was a good thing to do. Uh, and this poem came out of that along with lots of other poems in the book. The Great Wall, 2016. When Matt Damon saved China by driving his spear into the alien's mouth. I was distracted by Lin May's long braided hair and the way she holds herself so still, ready to strike down her enemies with a knife in each fist. But some things are fixed in the white savior narrative, like the exotic love interest who will risk everything as ancient cities crumble around her. And when you asked me what I thought afterwards in the autumn rain, I wanted to say some parts were beautiful, like the pagoda of iridescent glass shattering into pieces of pink and blue light, just as Lin May lets loose her arrow. And also when you whispered something in my ear, and I was hit by the shockwave caused by my body and your breath existing in the same moment in the same universe. Months later, you told me you cried during Rogue One, the scene where two men hold each other, weeping beneath the palm trees and light beams blasting the leaves apart and their hands shaking, moments before a star destroying weapon obliterates their small, wrecked portion of universe. I didn't know what to do with these space opera feelings, only that I had to exit this particular narrative in which our knees are just touching and we're laughing while the city disappears around us, as if we could reach back through hyperspace to touch the silver holograms of our past selves as if we could go back to some other time on some other planet before the first particles of energy let go of themselves, like the thousand paper lanterns released into the sky above the Great Wall, a thousand tiny fires trapped inside. Um, sorry, the next one is towards the end of the collection. Um, I'll just read a couple more. This one is a, a Wellington poem, but wrote it while in Shanghai after quite a serious earthquake happened in, in Aotearoa. Um, it ended up not being as bad as it was initially thought, uh, but there was a tsunami warning, which is quite common when there's an earthquake in New Zealand. And I was in my dorm room listening to the radio for updates through the night. And uh, this is a poem that came out of the scraps of uh, updates that I heard. The first wave. They request that we inform you immediately. You are standing on soft ground. The ceiling lights are swinging in the background. The waves crash then dissipate. The first wave may not be the largest. This is a flow on event, so do not go near. Do not stay and watch the land slipping. It has triggered other faults like a network of nerves and the seabed has risen out of the sea. There are visible ruptures running along the landscape. This is a flow on event, but the moon does not cause earthquakes. The ceiling lights are a typical pattern of aftershocks and they request that we inform you, you are a visible rupture running along the landscape. Do not stay and watch your nerves slipping. There will be strong currents in the background. The moon has risen out of the sea. The first wave crashes, then dissipates. You are standing on such soft ground.
Last summer, we were underwater. And we ask, what are you doing there, moon? Our bodies neck deep in salt and rain. Each crater is a sea, you said, and dived under the sun. Before I could speak, water rushing over your skin, the place where chocolate ice cream had melted and dried there like a newly formed freckle on the surface of us. And the islands crumpling apart softly over sea caves somewhere, opening my mouth into the waves to say, you are, you are, you are. Um, I'll finish now with a poem I didn't originally intend to read, but um, listening to Mary Jean made me think that this one might be a, a nice one to read. And it is a sonnet, it's my only sonnet ever. <laughs> sonnet with particles of gold. Today, scientists discovered the origins of gold. The sound of egg noodles crisping up in the wok. The garden carpeted in kofi petals, the way my phone corrects romati, summer to rainstorm. The day after my grandmother died was white gold in color. A star explodes and wings are found among the debris, along with pieces of a character I never memorized, our only name for her, poor, a woman beneath a wave. Drift, she mouthed softly in English. What is drift? My mother translates into her language, not one of mine. I try to make myself remember by writing pour over and over on squares of paper covering the walls. So I am surrounded by the women and the water radicals they hold close. The tips of waves touch me in my sleep. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Nina. Wonderful reading as well. Um, so we pass now to uh, Theophilus Quack. Uh, Theophilus Quack is a writer and researcher currently based in Singapore. Uh, he has published five, uh, four volumes of poetry. Uh, they speak only our mother tongue, 2011, Circle Line, 2013, Giving Ground 2016, and most recently Moving House in 2020. Two of his collections were shortlisted for Singapore Literature Prize. His poems, uh, translations and essays have appeared in a number of periodicals, including The Guardian, Times Literary Supplements, The uh, London Magazine, Macomb Review and others. He's also an editor, critic, and awarded translator. His translation of Wang Yu Wa's poem, Moving House, won second place in the prestigious Stephen Spendler, Spender Prize uh, for Poetry in Translation in 2016. One of his poems uh, was performed at the 2016 Oxford New Writing Festival. Uh, the poem was also adapted uh, um, as a chamber opera by Daniel Lim. And Theo even wrote a libretto for a musical by Peter Shepherd, uh, This Was Lousy. Uh, he writes across space, time, media, and genres, reflecting his own experience of migrancy. Uh, together with Mary Jean, uh, is co-editor of Oxford Poetry, and he's also a Singapore editor at large for the wonderful Asymptote, a Taiwan-based uh, online literary journal. In 2016, Quack co-founded The Kindly, an online poetry journal, and in 2017, he co-edited two anthologies of poems, Flight and Unfree Verse. The first poem he will read for us today is titled Grandfather Visits Pyongyang. Theo to you. 
Hi, Cosma. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I, yeah, I, I felt like um, I should start by pointing out that um, MJ and I are actually no longer editors of Oxford Poetry. Um, but, but this was only a very recent change, um, and the journal is now in the very good hands of Luke Allen. Um, and I encourage all of you to, to check it out. Um, I will read the poem, My Grandfather Visits Pyongyang, slightly later. Um, I thought I'd respond first to Mary Jean's poem about the lockdown um, with a COVID-19 poem of my own. Um, I'm really sorry we're in that time of human history, um, and there's no other way to start a reading than with a pandemic poem. Uh, this poem is called uh, The Two Most Bravest Humans, um, and uh, it's, well, let me just read it. The Two Most Bravest Humans. Um, it, it starts with an epigraph from Channel News Asia um, that Singapore began its vaccination exercise uh, last December with healthcare workers like my parents, the first um, to be vaccinated. Mother goes first and says it's nothing, is back on her rounds the morning after. So much for fear. Her patients don't know what it is she's done, but that it brings her back, nurses too, Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays with those boxes of pills. Sometimes no one else comes, so they're all there is, wrapped up in their gloves and gowns, dispensing cheer. Next is father's. And since it hasn't been that long, really, since his sickness went away, we only pretend not to worry. But that same week, he's back at it, full swing, his clinic packed straight through the balmy mornings. At dinner some, one night, someone says, well, maybe let's wait and see. Something about the side effects that take months to show. Others nod their heads, just so much we don't know. It's still light when I get up to go, but all I can see is the two of them at home, one standing and the other at the kitchen table painting, the brown soft strokes of a face, two faces, and the two most bravest humans, although they never say so. Um, I also thought to respond to a poem that Nina read. Um, the mention of persimmons uh, reminded me of this poem from Moving House um, that I'm about to read. Um, this poem is called The Way Light Works. Um, and it's a poem that I wrote about um, a traffic accident uh, in late 2017, um, in which some migrant workers were killed, uh, who were being transported in a very unsafe manner at the back of a, a work lorry. Um, and uh, here in Singapore, we have just had a recurring spate of those accidents again this year. Um, so it seems apt. The way light works. They'll say it isn't good for you, but if you paid attention, for about an hour each morning, you could look at the sun. When it puts its head up, it's still the color of cheap vests. Keep looking and it turns white and oh, like a speed sign. Or the moon when they show it in pictures. I learned that the way light works, this happens to everything. I can see through my fingers. Dropped leaves pretend they're alive. And the bus stop is full of towels that are orange as persimmons. When those are cut into little squares, they won't even stay on your tongue. Now, why call these safety vests? I think they just make us seem dangerous. I was standing at the bus stop with Vinoth, who would be turning 24. Except the bus didn't. Why call it a speed sign? In the evening, they call and say, before six, it's hard to see anything. When boss answers, he looks the other way so we can't see his lips. Well, no matter, for now all I have are these questions, and not just about the things we call things. How come they say morning has broken? I am still a citizen of the morning. That's the way light works. Um, here's another poem from Moving House, and it's the first poem that Cosma mentioned earlier. Um, it's called My Grandfather Visits Pyongyang. Um, a brief introduction to this poem is that my grandfather was an inveterate traveler um, uh, when he was alive, so much so that we would not know uh, which country it was that he was heading off to this time, and he would return with souvenirs from 
strange places that we'd never even think to travel. Well, after he passed away, we were looking through the many, many photographs that he left behind. And um, some of the photographs that we, we found, we couldn't quite place until a cousin of mine watched a TV documentary about North Korea and realized that without telling any of us, my grandfather had visited Pyongyang. My grandfather visits Pyongyang. Too late, we find among his photographs a kingdom mostly dreamed of. It's absurd architecture, where he alighted sometime in October. Frame after frame resists comparison. There isn't a place we've seen that stands as still, or with the same intent raises its glass towards heaven, all normalcy locked within a sound that these pictures don't contain, a pitch rung in the earth's confines too low for human hearing. Friends tell us to allow ourselves the time it takes to grieve, or whatever brings us back to last year's long continuum, but something stays the eye. How in some perspectives here, he's already gone. Gone from the boulevards where white crowned trees fill up the viewfinder, and men and women in work clothes hover outside our field of vision. He's somewhere else entirely. Now close, now looking in, the disappearance nothing more than a trick of the lens, but we fall for it again and again. How like him, we think, and then catch ourselves. The leaves turn on their own impulse in our hands. Um, lots of people have asked uh, why this book is called Moving House. Uh, it's actually the title of the last poem in the book. Um, and uh, there is also a story behind this. Once again, it's um, about my parents. This is becoming a bit of a theme. Um, <laughs> one year, uh, this was in 2017, my final year uh, in the UK before coming back to Singapore. Um, and uh, when I was in the UK, I used to Skype my parents in Singapore about once a week. And one day when I Skyped them, um, there was something about the background that seemed a little bit different. So, you know, I asked, uh, are you guys outside? Um, you gone for a walk or something? And they said, no, 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 we live here now. And I realized that without telling me in typical Asian parent fashion, they had moved houses um, and, uh, and kind of just forgot uh, to inform me. Um, and I felt in that moment, just a little hint um, of the sense of dislocation of uh, somewhere that you know as home uh, being, being gone. Uh, without you being able to say goodbye. So this poem is called Moving House. Now these are things that shake us in our sleep. Doors left open, drawers, the bare-backed chair that still without a coat swivels gently, books in boxes, pictures taken down their squares of darker paint turned over to the sun, and above all, the wiring undone, the lights, glass tubes put away in plastic. Once is enough. The eye learns to plot all of this in each new habitation, recognize the empty rooms, joints, pivots, dimensions. Well, every house has a skeleton. Well, the body learns that it must carry less from place to place, a kind of tidiness that builds and hardens. Some call it fear of change or of losing what we cannot keep. Others, experience. Truth is, it has no name or station, and only the weight we give. Old friend, I feel its steep tug again this evening, across wire and lens, as you show me the house, a bare continent. These are things that shake us in our sleep. Well, I thought I'd also read some newer poems, um, partly inspired by Mary Jean's choices as well. Um, and uh, one of the new poems that um, I'm about to read uh, is called Kong. Um, uh, its name comes from the name of a pro wrestler um, who was given the stage name King Kong uh, in the waning years of the British Empire when uh, Singapore was one of the um, well known as the Pearl of the Pearl of the Orient, uh, was one of the um, pit stops along the kind of international 
uh, circulation of uh, circuses and shows. Um, and of course, this was a problematic enterprise. Um, people, often non-white people, um, would often be paraded in front of largely white fee-paying audiences um, at these circuses. Um, so there are two poems that I'm about to read. The first is called Kong, as I've mentioned, and the second is likewise based around this phenomenon, and they're part of an ongoing project that I'm working on. Um, um, I, I won't say too much more about the poem, except that King Kong, um, well, the, the wrestler known as King Kong, eventually moved back to Singapore um, and passed away here. Kong. They called him King. Other names came later. Samson, Hercules. But this one stuck. A name he could twirl overhead as the crowd cheered. One with its own weight class. No longer Emil. They trembled at a thud as he took the stage. Made short work of the others. Tiger Ahmad, Gorilla Wong. The whole great world rising to their feet. Even Wildcat Hassan, who in 47 had gone up against the star of the British Army base, was no match. Everyone knew the ring belonged to the boy from Budapest with the brazen hands. Backstage, another world was being formed in the sharp shadows of those stadium lamps. Each lock and throw and echo of the long night's hold slipping surely into the morning. By the time he wound up at Sipai Po, Pulled from a car's still steel grip, his own gnarled fingers loosening, the realm he knew had ceded title to another. A clean flip, it happened right before his eyes. Years later, they said they hadn't seen it coming. The next new poem I'm about to read um, is called Morning at the Raffles Hotel. Um, and this poem draws on. Um, a story that is often told and retold in the mythology of imperialism in Singapore. Um, and in this story, um, a schoolmaster, actually the schoolmaster of the school that I went to, Raffles Institution, a schoolmaster was awoken one early morning by reports that there was a tiger under the table of the billet room at the Raffles Hotel. The drunk schoolmaster, hung over after a night um, of partying, um, came out with his shotgun and made short work of the tiger. Um, and stories say that this is the last tiger that was shot in Singapore. Strangely enough, no pelt was ever found for this tiger. Um, no one could locate the carcass or the skin. And the only eyewitness to this story was a frightened Chinese serving boy at the Raffles Hotel. So this poem, uh, it's a poem in several parts. Um, uh, it's called Morning at a Raffles Hotel, um, and it tries to retell this story from a few different angles. Um, I will read each part as a numbered section before I begin. Morning at a Raffles Hotel. One. No, play, play it again. A circless handler leaves a gate unlatched. A hired watchman looks the other way. A serving boy stoops silent on a stair as a teacher aims, maims the teak table. No one awake to sight the telltale pelt, only a barman skimming a potted tail, embellished with the spices of the fleet to mend a foot. Here, the scent of a shot lingers, like skin on a wall. It is how it is in the tropics. It is the plot. Two. They was one of us. That night they ran, we was hid by the beach. So to not get beat, we knew if we had known that they was running, we would be beat bad till they would say where they was. Morning, someone say they was dead. We say we not knew, but we did. Three. Tiger shooting extraordinary. Singapore Free Press and Mercantile Advertiser. Last Sunday, some Kling showman brought a fully grown tiger over here from Johor, which they exhibited in a show tent on the Beach Road reclamation site. Late the same night, the wild animal broke loose and for two days has been roaming at large, having defied all efforts at capture. 
for? Well, in one version, I am asleep. In true oriental fashion, the newspaper says, he did not trouble himself to find out what it was. Well, the truth, if you'd been there and seen a tongue's red gash steeping the felt carpet or heard the chain rattling like a tail across the floor, you'd know there was no need. And in any case, it fixed me on a stare, that glare like a song of songs, a last will and testament or a dare. Five. In 1902, the last tiger that was killed in Singapore was pursued at Raffles Hotel, Singapore. A colleague saw the tiger and requested the help of the headmaster, who was known to be a hunter and a sharpshooter. It was dark, and with his loaded gun, he fired three missed shots at the tiger. The right opportunity for him to redeem his reputation came when he caught the gleaming eyes of the tiger. As bystanders approached the body, the tiger's head rose. He pulled his trigger again, and the last tiger in Singapore finally laid its head to rest under the bar and billiard room. RaffleSingapore.com slash True Raffle Stories. Six. Build us a room, they said, and let it be known in the distant corners of these parts for its fine proportions, state of the art, and in time we hope for its clientele. Observe its equal columns, its cool interior, providing respite from the noontime sun, felt on the tables, fresh chalk cues, and even the floor raised to level the playing field. A room for gentlemen of some distinction, but not out of reach to the second sun. Could it be done? Well, yes. And so we made a room open on all sides to the sailor's breeze, sanded the floor till it shone like the moon on an August night, which is to say a room we never dream of entering, a room to shoot the breeze, a room to set them right. And finally, part seven. Well, these days, one can buy a figurine at the hotel store and find a likeness printed on cards and aprons. In children's books, it gazes friendly from the page beside the grazing humans. But what we know, we know that once upon a colonial morning, a beast hunted, haunted instead. Now the red brickwork's been painted black and silent hands scrub these chalky walls. But still, some days that's all it takes. A half-glimpsed coat or mane a flame to put a fire under this room again. Um, cool. Um, just going to gather my thoughts. Um, the very last poem I will read, um, thank you all for putting up with me so far, uh, is a shorter poem that's called The View. Um, this poem was written on National Day last year, um, which Singapore celebrates on the 9th of August every year. Um, and as in many places around the world, um, Singapore is experiencing its own spate of somewhat virulent nationalism. Um, it's a development that has concerned many of us, especially those of us who think about wider horizons than that of the nation state. But it is uh, a frame or a phenomenon that's difficult to escape from and that I think we must all reckon with in our own ways. So this poem was written on National Day last year. It's called The View. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just read it. Thank you very much for listening. The View. Somewhere, a flag is torn from its plastic. A child ties the strings to a window grill and a blood shadow falls across the room. There is red over everything. The chairs, which were always beige, and also the floor, which is marble and washes easily. Though so even on television, the men seem to redden as they troop into sight. Nothing escapes. Close your eyes and the darkness takes on a pinkish hue, which gathers from all sides like a flood. It's hard to see now with all this red, 
or that is, if you were one to celebrate the view before. Even harder to imagine how the room could have been, with its softer colours meant to set off the coastal light. I think of it sometimes, the low carved table, the worn coffee mugs, and out our open doorway, the corridor. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, happy to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Theo. That was really nice reading and uh, bordering storytelling sometimes. I was really amazed by your ability to read that, that tiger story. Um, so I'm sure there are plenty of questions ready for the three poets. Uh, but if not, or until you warm up, um, I'd like to use my rights as chair to ask the first question. So to, to my mind, uh, one of the most uh, striking features of your works is, to, um, is this uh, linguistic variety that I can see. So I'm, I'm talking about not just English, French, Chinese or Maori, but also this variety, vernacular variety of Chinese that uh, is often restricted to uh, domestic family use and um, and also this, this reliance on sound. I, I love that, you know, both in, in uh, uh, Mary Jean, in Nina, and also in Theo, this, this idea that uh, memory are triggered by sound rather than, uh, you know, just the photograph of the grandpa, um, grandfather. So I think uh, your poetry is certainly full of voices. Uh, these words gained and words lost words that are written but especially orally transmitted uh, and these are memory loaded uh, uh, words um, uh, and and these are also words that travel the world so uh, such a dynamic encounter I think produces special maps of intersections with uh, other places and literatures, uh, which I think uh, enriches and, and complicates the uh, comprehensive picture of Chinese Sinophone world and transnational hyphenated literature. So my question is, how would you translate your own poetry in another language? Would you use a standard version or of the target language? Uh, uh, so to, to, uh, to make justice of these exchanging voices, pronunciations, syntaxes, and lexicons uh, of your poetry. Um, yes, who wants to? to answer first? I can try. Uh, it's a very difficult and really interesting question. Thank you so much. Um, and I don't know that uh, I have a straightforward answer since despite um, being of Chinese heritage, uh, Malaysian Chinese heritage, um, English is the language that I'm really fully fluent in. English is the language I write in and, and think in and all of that, you know? So but I think what poetry has brought me um, is imagining different types of fluency beyond uh, just maybe conventional fluency, linguistic and oral, um, and that's partly, that's been kind of my journey in, in trying to get closer and find some kind of intimacy with these languages, particularly Mandarin, Cantonese and Hakka, which are part of my family, but which I cannot, well, Mandarin, I can speak a little bit. The others, you know, the sounds are so deeply familiar to me when I'm surrounded suddenly by like Hakka speakers or Cantonese speakers. Um, it, I really feel a, a kind of belonging, even though I don't really necessarily belong in that space. So I'm interested in poems as um, 
spaces of uh, physical fluency, maybe in the ways that we try to locate, um, the ways we try to translate our maybe memories, um, experiences into other languages in the space of a poem. So maybe a poem can be like a third space <laughs> um, between uh, one language and another. For me, that's how it is anyway. And really, I mean, I wouldn't be able to, to kind of fully translate my poem into another language. So yeah, I'm interested in in betweenness and um, maybe, it, yeah, the act of a physical translation in a poem. <laughs> Mm, thank you. Thanks. Yes. Anyone of um, Althea, Mary Jane, would you like to add anything to this? Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say I, I really resonated with um, Nina's comments about the poem being a third space. Um, I, I think, well, when I do poetry workshops and, and talk to students, I often um, describe the poem as something that um, has to be somehow tethered to the moment, um, but also lifts us out of the moments into um into a space that that uh that reaches across any of these boundaries um and can be universal or can achieve a kind of universality um so i do think the poem is a is a vehicle that shuttles between the local and the universal in that way um and in, in linguistic terms as well it inhabits a space that we would not normally speak in um so directly or at least for most poems um, some poems, of course, use a spoken effect um, uh, to their advantage. But most poems inhabit that space that we wouldn't speak in or access necessarily on a daily basis. And, and this became especially acute to me, coming back to your question about translation. Um, when I first arrived in the UK, um, and I was wondering how um, my, my reading voice would sound to a British audience, um, because in, in, in Singapore, we are used to speaking in Singlish, or what we call Singlish, which is a, a Creole. And um, it's a Creole also with many different varieties. So if you heard a Singaporean of Chinese background speaking in Singlish or a Singaporean of Malay background sing speaking in Singlish, you may also be able to tell their Singlishes apart. And the same goes for socioeconomic status, etc. And so I, I, I did wonder how these different Singlishes would translate into English with with a British or international audience. Um, I was, during my time in the UK, I was fortunate um, to, to be in a city that was very global. And in a sense, there was that kind of acceptance of a global voice, but not every city looks or sounds like that. And I think as the voice travels into different audiences, um, there are some things that, um, that don't get translated so easily. Um, thankfully though, I've also found that most audiences are willing to listen beyond their own linguistic world. And what I mean by that is uh, most audiences are willing to, to suspend disbelief in a sense, um, to, to be at peace with the fact that they may not understand every single thing or detail that's going on or every reference in a poem, but still be able to connect with the poet at some level despite that, through, through sound, through rhythm, um, through cadence, etc. cetera. Um, and that's one of the things that, um, that strikes me as being part of the universality of the poem as well. So this doesn't really answer your question on how to translate my own work. Maybe a different way of looking at it would be that poems are already, always already translated in the act of the writing and reading. Yeah. Thank you, wonderful. Maybe Jane, anything to add? Yeah, I would really agree with what Nina and Theo said. Um, I think one small thing I can add perhaps is because, um, and this is quite a new experience for me, that I've been working with a colleague at Oxford Brooks who is a French translator. Um, she's French and she translates from English into French. And so we've been sort of collaborating with um, the fact that she's interested in translating some of my poems into French. And it's been a very interesting process because for example, she would ask me, you know, in terms of the you, obviously in French, you've got the tu or the vous, and she was like, which one is it? And I actually had never considered that because obviously in English, there's only one you, but obviously in Chinese, you've got the ni and nin, for example. So like a kind of more uh, respectful you um, that you use with your elders, for example. And so that was something that was new for me linguistically to consider. Um, and also there were like surprises along the way. For example, there's a line in one of my poems where I, I say some seas are colder than others. So meaning the actual sea. Um, but obviously in French, the word ne is like, sounds like the sea or mother. 
So she was like, there's now that added double meaning of some mothers are colder than others, mm -hmm. uh, which I really loved because there is, you know, a lot of poems about mothers in my work. So it's just the joy of kind of discovering puns that exist in certain languages that won't exist in, you know, English, for example, but there were also meanings in English that had to be lost in the French mm -hmm. version, for example, mm -hmm. um, because she said, if we had to do this in syntax, it wouldn't make sense. So the poetic line would be so long. We were talking about how some languages need a lot more words to say the same thing. And it made me realize that English is actually quite a compact language, but then Chinese is even more compact. French can sometimes be quite elongated in how it needs to express something, the same thing, for example. But that was really a joyful experience for me. So I think that's my sort of beginnings of looking at translating my own work into another language. Wonderful, thank you. I've got a, a question from David in the chat. David, would you like to uh, to um, speak your question directly? Yeah, or you... I, you know, I put it in the chat because if I if I open my mouth, I just rub it on for hours. But <laughs> I'll read what I've said. Um, uh, I'm interested in how you find or how you feel the tension between your use of language and what's been described as translingualism as something painful or, or joyful. Um, I felt this tension came through in all of your readings um, very explicitly with Mary Jean, I think, where she said um, English was thrust upon me. And then she said, later, I fell in love with English or did I? Uh, and um, so, I mean, is translingualism something that you find painful or is it actually playful is it a game uh, or, or or both I'm, I'm interested in just how you come at this and how you feel about it maybe i'll start uh david thank you so much for that question i think that's something i'm literally trying to work through now in some of my newer poems um flesh was so much about you know my mother my relationship with my mother and queerness and, and coming into one's own uh, sort of coming of age moment but I think now, um, especially in the wake of COVID, it's, it's brought me back to my relationship with English and the tensions I felt all along, really. This, this idea of having to perform a kind of Englishness to, to kind of feel accepted in the UK, um, but then also realizing that so much of my upbringing was very deeply colonial or post-colonial. But obviously there was a kind of expectation that we would have to perform a kind of uh, bilingualism that was very skewed towards, you know, Englishness or a specific type of Englishness that has class connotations as well. Um, so I think, um, but it's true, I fell in love with English of my own accord, you know, especially when I discovered Shakespeare. And I write about that elsewhere when I found Twelfth Night and found the character of Cesario and realized that you could play with gender, that something that was so serious and heavy in my life could become playful. And I could only access that, access that through English at the time. And so English became for me a language in which gender could be performative and playful. And that was really helpful for me, um, whereas I couldn't find the same thing in Chinese. Um, whereas now I'm thinking back to, I mean, since we're talking about translation, how, you know, we talk about pronouns in English, whereas in, in Chinese or in Cantonese or Mandarin, really, um, the pronouns for she and he are the same uh, when you say it, ta, right, it sounds the same. Or, or in Cantonese, ko, it's actually gender neutral. Um, it sounds like them, basically, and you don't really know the gender of that person until it is revealed through context. So I think for me, language is often both painful and playful. I think it really depends on the context and where you're at with it in terms of your negotiation. I think with, with English, I found a kind of peace with it, I think, because I recognize the pain that it's brought me as, as a younger child, feeling the pressure to acquire English. Um, but now, actually, I've found aspects of it that have been very liberating for me as well. Thank you. Any other question? Otherwise, I, I have a follow up for that. <laughs> so yes, um, I think that David uh, was was um, expressing something that I also thought about um, your poems, uh, uh, and I. I resolved by thinking that this there is this tension so as a matter of fact attention has to 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 have two uh two contrasting forces um and in particular i think that um, language in these poems is is both joyful and uh, painful but also um, uh, is mainly um, a cause of sleep, slippage and uh, instability. And that's what I, I find most uh, interesting, most, most uh, um, 
this interlingual aesthetics that uh, that uh, I I believe um, creates um, works as as a creative force. Uh, but going back also to what you Nina said about fluency, I was um, just um, thinking, uh, uh, um, you know, because writing in in one's uh, 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 native tongue as you do in English, right? Uh, seems quite natural, and uh, I guess uh, if you work with some uh, um, less familiar language, like with Maori or with uh, Chinese, um, I guess that the, the 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 effect is is basically to slow you down. Perhaps I don't know when I have to to write in Chinese or in English or in Italian, really, <laughs> because now I am confused. Um, um, I, I always think that I am much slower than than the um, writing in a mother tongue uh, from um, um, a, 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 a place where everybody speaks that language. So I wonder if this fluency that you were talking about, um, you know, is not a slowed, a slowed down or uh, you become a little bit more cautious with uh, uh, words because of these three different languages co going on in your poems. And I also want to ask if you intend to, to use uh, still Chinese uh, uh, in your writing in the future. Mm. Um, I love what you pointed out about um, pace and slowness. I think that's certainly true. I mean, just by, by nature of the fact that my Mandarin is bad. <laughs> so it's in, in my life, there's been varying levels of, um, of you know, fluency to use that word again. Um, and so absolutely it's, it's uh, something that definitely slows me down. But uh, there is a poem in, in the book, which um, I didn't read, but it, I think it's called Conversational Chinese. Um, and it, in it, I was interested in um, using my Mandarin in its most natural, flawed, riddled with grammatical errors um, kind of state. So I, I wasn't it, normally, you know, when I'll, when I'll incorporate um, uh, Cantonese or Hakka or Mandarin in my work, I will like ask maybe get my mom to check it or double check it quite a few times myself you know but in this in this one poem I was interested in um yeah I guess the the purest state of the language as it would come out in, in my first attempt basically and so and that's for me is it was quite a yeah quite an uh, embarrassing thing quite a exposing thing to to try out, but um, but it was also like Mary Jean said, uh, it was very liberating as well, and to to just no longer worry about correctness about translating this for a non Chinese speaking audience, um, because I think it was maybe three years ago, I actually attended an amazing poetry reading. Um, and Mary Jean, you said something amazing about, I think you were talking about whether or not th there ought to be a glossary or glossing words in general that are not in English. And, um, you were so, you spoke so well about just how you were adamant that this wasn't something that was necessary and just to decenter this white gaze and resist translation and resist um glossing and that had a, such a profound impact on me I think I was already like moving towards that and feeling that but just getting that kind of like confirmation from someone else was so amazing and so that had a huge impact on how then I would start using more and more Mandarin and you mentioned Māori as well so, and in Aotearoa New Zealand um Māori is becoming increasingly 
in everyday language, which is so amazing. It wasn't really when I was growing up, but that's changing. And so, and I myself don't speak Māori, but I am um, a very beginner learner. And there are aspects of the natural world and the landscape, particularly trees, flowers, places, um, that in English, in everyday English in New Zealand, there's lo lots and lots of Māori vocabulary, that, vocabulary that's everyday. And so that's so important to me to incorporate that because that's part of my linguistic world. Um, and just or thinking of language through this colonial lens always, since the, I have these different um, conflicting kind of colonial backgrounds in my heritage. So it all, it all comes through. And I do hope to continue definitely writing more about language and using different languages. Um, but I do think that this book, Mulan, was a kind of um, pinnacle of me trying to work out these questions of language loss and language learning at the same time, because so much of it was written while I was basically in, in like full immersion classes kind of condition. And I'm not now. So that definitely changes how I write and, and how language appears in my writing. Yes, and this comes also true um, through uh, when, when you see some experimental um, devices that you use, like the inversion of the use of uh, italics and so on. Anyone else wants to add? There is a, a follow up by David. David, again, could you, would you mind like, speaking your own? Uh, I'm very happy to hold back if anybody else is waiting to ask a question. I don't think um, we are. I can't see Filippo any... has his hand up. Oh, Filippo. Filippo, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no problem. Um, I mean, um, I could wait for David anyway. <laughs> so um, so f uh, lower my hand. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you all poets and chair for uh, such a very interesting event. And uh, I'm not uh, an expert on poetry, so it was really interesting and riveting, especially uh, to hear poets poems read, uh, which is always very useful. And so I was, I was thinking also one one of the things that really uh, intrigued me even in hearing poem, listening to poems from authors who are in their twenties or early thirties, uh, a relationship which I think there was also with, with history because I think all of you deal with that in, in diff very different ways. So I think this is also very good with with the pairing of the poems, um, with ideas that, for example, with, with Mary Jean deal with the colonial past and education, also the fact that the relationship with English, I really like that bit about, the, 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 I fell in love with English of my own accord of did I? So it also brought to my mind ideas of um, heritage, but also how, how, free, how free we are in our choices, even our love. So like, yeah. With, with Nina, it, um, it struck me also how this negotiation with a source of, of history and heritage was possibly performed or recuperated through a lot of colors. I really love the, 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 the games of um, interplay of colors and, and, and water in your, in your work. And we feel, um, I, I, I really like also the, the, the engagement with episodes in, in the history of Singapore. So, uh, it, I felt like uh, in all your works, you were, you were dealing in, in some ways with, with recuperation of history that, that even, if, even if it's fragmented, even if it's from personal experience, I think there was an engagement with that. So I, was, I, was, I wanted to ask all of you if you had any thoughts on or, or any uh, you know, feelings and awareness that you had about that process when you were motivated to write your poems or even when you were in the process of writing that. Thank you. Theo, maybe you could go. Yeah, sorry, I was just um, thinking through that answer, but um, yeah, um, history is something that I engage with a lot in my writing. Um, because I, I think I see well, I think I see a big part of my writing as not necessarily trying to um, foreground, in a sense, my own voice or perspective, but to try to um, inhabit or bring to light uh, a story that might not have otherwise been heard, um, not, to, not to replace or supplant that historical voice, um, 
but to tell it in a way that um, if it had not been told, might not have been heard ever altogether. Um, sorry, I'm not putting that very grammatically, but I, well, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so many poems in Moving House uh, do deal with aspects of Singapore history. Um, I, I do try to focus on peeling back uh, colonial or post-colonial narratives um, of state histories, especially, uh, to see what the hidden stories are beneath that. Um, and sometimes these stories, I think, point us to, um, to dualities or to mixed realities that don't sit so well with our kind of clear black and white um, ideological frames that we often approach history with. So for instance, uh, let me give you an example. There's a poem in here um, that's about um, a, a group of, well, oh, there's a poem in here about a training school um, that was established uh, just before the Japanese invasion of Singapore during World War II. Um, and, and at this training school, uh, the British administration at that time uh, tried to build up a communist guerrilla force um, to join their ranks in resisting uh, the Japanese when, when they invaded. And um, of course, thinking back today, uh, when the, in the post-war period, um, when, when the British returned and reimposed colonial governance, Singapore became caught up in the nascent years of the early Cold War. Um, and this, this period where British forces had collaborated directly with communist forces before World War II was, was erased from the archives and only kind of dug up again many years later. Um, so there is a poem in here about the soldiers in that training school. Um, not so much how they would have felt like um, being caught between these two ideological worlds, but more about what their daily uncertain lived reality is about being trained for an invasion they couldn't expect um, what was like. Um, so the daily reality is about cleaning their rifles, about um, seeing a glint of gold in the river outside of the training shed. Um, uh, elements like that that help us to connect with these soldiers who, who seem so absurd in their historical moment from our point of view, um, but, but, but tries to imagine what their, um, what their humanity would have been like. Um, yeah. I probably do this explaining better in a poem than, <laughs> than actually trying to come up with an answer to a question. Um, but that's what's going through my mind when I write about these historical episodes. Um, so as with the two poems that you read earlier, um, with Kong, uh, we, we don't have any surviving known records of um, Kong in his own words, of King Kong in his own words. Um, his, his, even his birth name is a, is a matter of speculation. Um, and of course, with the incident at Raffles Hotel, um, all we have are very unreliable narratives to go on. Um, so the poet's task, given the limitations of the historical sources, is, is to put ourselves in the shoes of the humans who lived then and to remind ourselves that they were humans too, and they had lived realities too, um, and to imagine what those lived realities were like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Would someone else like to rescue me now from this question? <laughs> I think um, I think probably we don't have any time for any other question. I'm afraid Sorry for or rambling on. Yes, because it's three uh, thirty. Um, oh, Jay, just... Jay has a question though. I, I've I've just seen a. Yes, Jay. Um... Maybe a quick question to wrap up potentially. Yes. Jay, do you want to ask? Hi. Hi. Yes. So I'm just curious. Um, maybe we could go around because I'm curious. Everyone here has written multiple books. What did you find surprising and or difficult from moving one book or project to the other? Um, maybe I could take a quick stab at that. Um, so I haven't actually written the second book in its entirety yet, but I think Moving on, it was interesting. Initially, I did feel like there were some themes 
or some even some forms like um, that I had already done perhaps in the first book that I thought I'd finished with, uh, but they've come back again. Um, some of my older poems I published in my pamphlet that weren't in flesh have oddly come back into the second manuscript in that um, I have a poem called The Translator that I wrote in my pamphlet that now I've kind of radically re revised, but it somehow has found a home in the second book because I think my first attempt at it was a very tentative one where I didn't really know what the kernel of the poem was, but it was still a poem back then uh, in 2018. But now it's kind of really um, fits into the puzzle that I'm trying to um, create for my second work. So I think that's interesting that old poems can almost come back and fit into a newer manuscript when you don't expect that to happen. Normally people think you write new work for the new book, but actually uh, quite a few older poems have come back into the picture for me. So that's that's one um, thing I found. And also an interest in prose poems. Um, Cosima mentioned that in the introduction where a lot of my poems are longer sort of lyric essay type poems that initially I never thought I could write. My poems in flesh are typically quite short. Um, I used to look on and envy with uh, at, at Nina's work or Will Harris's, you know, some poets naturally write really long sequences and, um, you know, sort of the poem just keeps going on. And I'm just like, how do you do that? Um, but I'm starting to experiment with longer poems in my newer uh, second manuscripts. So. Um, that's a great question, Jay. I, yeah, as you know, I also am like often switching genres. Um, quite often think I'm working on a poem and it's actually an essay or I'm working on an essay and it's like more like a poem, which is confusing. Um, but yeah, moving on to, to like new projects. For me, I have to kind of think of uh, the, the books I've written as um, like project books. And so I, I very much think of Magnolia as, as my kind of Shanghai book, which is not to say I don't write about Shanghai and, and other places I definitely have, but it definitely feels like a self-contained thing. And then, um, yeah, I, I think I had my, so my, my book of essays came out this year and now I feel that I'm very much drawn back to shorter forms and poems. And I think of maybe thinking about working on some kind of hybrid work um, that is going to be about food. I mean, you didn't ask what we're working on, but this, this is what's on my mind. Um, and I, yeah, I think I, I tend to like hop between topics and I'll go through phases and write, be writing a lot about language and language loss. And, and then I'll kind of leave it for a little while and then I'll, and then quite often for me, I'll, then I'll turn to writing about food <laughs> and then I'll like switch back and forth. And so now I think I'm heading into a, a food phase. I, um, I don't know how it is for other poets, but I, I, th I think I definitely outgrow my own books. Um, many of the poems that I, I look at in Moving House these days, uh, I would not have written them the same way again. Um, and I think uh, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't uh, try to disown any of them, but I think they, they, they take on a path of their own after they've been published and they inhabit a world and a time of their own as well. Um, but, but I've also grown into a different person since writing that book. Um, and I've, I've grown into new projects and new, new ideas. Um, uh, again, you didn't ask what we're working on now, um, but I'm... Uh, I, I'm currently also working on a, a couple of essays, um, uh, some some auto fiction and some uh, uh, essays about um, place place writing, um, but what that looks like uh, in a small city like Singapore in a lockdown, um, and kind of being forced to reconfront and uh, revisit many places that I thought were familiar, but now look utterly different. Um, perhaps some bits of these, uh, these essays will become poems. Um, I have no way of telling yet. Uh, and uh, similar to MJ and Nina, so I think we, we all um, have shuttled between different genres. Um, and, and that's something that I, um, I hope to keep adding to. I hope to keep kind of expanding the genre toolkit so that you know, when you have something to say, you're not limited by one way of saying it. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid we don't have any more time <laughs> left, but perhaps we can take this conversation to some other occasion. And um, thanks, Nina. Thanks, Mary Jean. Thanks, Theo, for your wonderful contribution to poetry. And um, goodbye.